Or did you all have a good Mother's Day? Mothers, did your families shower you with blessings? I hope so. It's so wonderful to see you all back here. What a blessing it is for us to gather in the house of the Lord, to worship Almighty God, to encourage one another, and to give the true God praise, glory, and honor. Amen. It's so wonderful to be with you all here tonight. Our main passage for this evening can be found in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 through 27. Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 through 27. Now, while you're turning there, I'm going to read you a sermon from another preacher. While you're turning there, I just want you to listen. Let's fill this atmosphere with warmth and love. God is love, and love is a healing remedy. It's a healing remedy. We're going to reach out to areas where man seems to have difficulty as we concentrate that the gifts of the Holy Spirit might function or what the secularists might say is the paranormal. Let us believe. Let us believe. And then this preacher, after he says this, he goes on to call a woman in this congregation. Her name was Sister Ingram. Sister Ingram had been struggling for a while to see since she was born. She, she could see, but it was kind of like me, where she, uh, she needed corrective lenses and she had very, very poor vision. So Sister Ingram, he asks her to stand up and he says with almost a prophetic tone, he says, you, you are concerned about your sight. You've not been able to see clearly. And she begins to cry, and she says, it's true. As he looks at her, and, and that the feeling of the room and the feeling that he's getting across is that he, he did not know that she had a problem with her eyes or with her sight. It was the Holy Spirit impressing upon him that told him that she could not see. So he asked her to stand up. She begins to cry and say, it's true, and he asks the question, you've told me nothing about your condition, and she says, no, I haven't. Then he says this, he says, take your glasses off. Let's dare with a little bit of faith. We've seen some of our sisters here totally blind, blind from childhood and healed. And then he looks at her in the back, and he says, I love you, the people love you, but most importantly, Christ loves you. And then she was healed. She could see. Do you know who preached that message? Whose sermon that was from? Jim Jones. How many of you have heard of Jim Jones? For those of you that haven't, most of the younger people probably don't know who Jim Jones is. They've probably heard of his nickname. He's called the Kool-Aid Man. Because he led his entire congregation, convincing them that the way to heaven was for them to drink a poisonous Kool-Aid and kill themselves, including the women, the men, and the children. Do I have your attention now as to what these false prophets sound like? They sound pleasing, don't they? They sound warm and inviting. They speak of Christ and love. They speak of God and His power. They speak of utilizing the Holy Spirit and they get everybody in and enticed. These false prophets, they don't, they don't want to step on your toes. They want you to be enamored in their message. Jim Jones, that was a Jim Jones sermon and folks, you can YouTube it. There are many just like it. Do I have your attention now as to what these false prophets sound like? Now, keeping that in mind, do I, uh, are, are we awake in here? Keeping that in mind, I invite you to please stand if you're able in reverence of the reading of God's Word. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, 
do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to malead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Let us pray. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for putting it on these people's hearts to gather them here tonight, to be obedient and to your word that commands us to gather. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit that is inside all of your believers would move us into a correct interpretation of this passage. Father, I pray that as you lead us through here tonight, that our hearts and our minds would be receptive, would be open. Father, that our hearts and our minds would be obedient and subject to your word. Lord, we thank you so much for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you so much for true preachers that you have instituted on this world. And God, I pray that you would lead your children to them. Lord, we love and praise you. I pray that you would forgive me of my sins, God, and Lord, that I pray that I would step out of the way and that you would make your message known. Lord, we love and praise you. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we do pray these things. Amen. So what's going on in this passage? Well, Jesus is, is teaching. He is nearing the end of his days, and he's teaching about specifically the last days. He had just got done telling them about the tribulation and what would happen during the tribulation. And what he said was that during the tribulation, when we get up to this point, he's talking about it, that there will be false prophets that arise. And now I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to say because it's imperative that you understand this. False prophets and false teachers will be able to do miracles. Do you understand? There is the supernatural world. We don't have to, I, I'm almost afraid that as Southern Baptists, we have neglected to talk about the Holy Spirit. We have neglected to talk about the supernatural world because it makes us feel a little uncomfortable. But the unfortunate part of that is, is that if we don't talk about it, Somebody else will. If we don't teach our kids what the supernatural world is, if we don't teach them what the Holy Spirit is, some other church, some other denomination, some other false prophet like Jim Jones will. Let me ask you something. Now, we, we can look back on, on who he was and what he did, but genuinely ask yourself, if you were in that, if you were in that congregation, and you witnessed the miracle for yourself, and you listened to the message that he preached, would you not at least be inclined towards his preaching? Would you not at least be inclined to listen? If you knew nothing about the Holy Spirit, and then you're sitting in the midst of a congregation where he claims that the Holy Spirit is performing a miracle, somebody who was blind can now see, would you not be enamored by that? I know I would. Fortunately, I've had some wonderful godly people in my life who have taught me about the Holy Spirit. Folks, there is the supernatural world. But listen to me. Not everything that is supernatural is of the Spirit of God. Not everything that is supernatural is of the Spirit of God. There are recorded miracles in Islam. There are recorded miracles in Buddhism. There are recorded miracles in Mormonism. There are recorded miracles in Hinduism. So if your faith is based on experience, specifically based on supernatural experience and emotionalism, then you may find that you will fall to any preacher or any speaker who comes and is able to flash you with a miracle. In fact, Jesus warns that that is how many people are going to fall away in the last day. I encourage you, I implore you, do not heap yourselves after people who can effect miracles, but heap yourself after people who teach from the word of God. 
Now, that is to say this. I do believe that God still does work miracles. Okay? I do believe that God still does work miracles. However, it is accordance to His will and His purpose, not my own. Furthermore, my faith is not in His miracles. My faith is in the gospel. Your faith should not be in miracles. Your faith should be in the gospel. I have had conversations with some people who genuinely believe that they are Christians, and yet they deny whole sections of the Bible because they claim that God himself spoke to them and told them what was true apart from the Scripture, and nobody could tell them anything different because of the experience, the supernatural experience of God speaking to them. Folks, if God says something in your ear that is contradictory to His Word, it is not God. We must always, always, always come back to the Word. 1 John 4, 1. It's not up there, so don't look for it. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. It is not... Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have been shamed because I would not just accept a miracle that has happened or a prophetic word that was given to me. Everything that has been given to me or that I have seen, and unfortunately, by poor experience, I have tested against God's word. I, I, there's, a, there's a false church in Troy, Alabama, and there's a pastor up there, and I, I believe I've spoken to you all about this previously, but he claims to have the gift of healing. He claims to have the gift of healing. I don't think he's there anymore. He, he moved it down to Florida. But anyway, he would get up there, and he would do something like this. And, and his congregation had hundreds of people out there, and he would go, God is telling me that somebody in here has some kind of stomach problem or some kind of stomach ache. And then, of course, somebody would come forward and he would lay hands on him and claim that she was healed. First of all, that's a farce, because if you get 100 people in a room, somebody in there is going to have a stomach ache. Somebody in there is going to have a stomach ache. And I'm going to be talking about that church in a little bit more, because it's one of the churches that, that I warned my congregation my previous congregation against when I was there. But these, these false prophets, these, these false teachers, they will spread all over the earth and they will be given abilities not by the Holy Spirit but by unclean spirits to lead many astray, to cause confusion and division. But if anything happens in here that is supernatural and it causes confusion against the brothers and sisters, it is not of God because our God is not a God of confusion. Whenever the Holy Spirit has been present in the churches, in the book of Acts and 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, whenever the acts of the Holy Spirit were being dished out, so to speak, there was unity in the church. But in too many churches today, you walk inside and they claim to have all of these gifts and they're all doing these different things, and it's a circus. People jumping over pews, running up and down the aisle, falling on the floor and seizing. Let me tell you something. There is not one ounce of Scripture that suggests that the Holy Spirit will make you fall on the floor and seize. Not one ounce. I, I looked for it. You understand? I've had so many people tell me that they've been slain in the Spirit and that I need to get slain in the Spirit. And when I ask them to support it with Scripture, they, they really can't. In fact, when we look at Scripture, there's only two individuals that have ever been, quote-unquote, slain in the Spirit, and they didn't wake up. But there is not one iota of Scripture that suggests that the Holy Spirit will cause you to fall to the ground and convulse, or cause you to lose your natural senses and function. There's not one ounce of Scripture. However, when you go back and you read who Jesus healed, you find that there are, in fact, demons who will cause you to convulse, who will cause you to fall down. It seems that whenever Jesus is present, whenever the Holy Spirit is present, you are actually steadied. 
So the evidence of the Holy Spirit in a church is not confusion. It's not a circus. It's not people falling down. The evidence of the Holy Spirit in the church is unity, and it is a collective steadiness standing on the Word of God. That is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is in a church. They will go all over the earth and they will be given the ability to do signs and wonders. I implore you, I beg you, do not place your faith in signs and wonders. And then they will make these claims that we are to continue Christ's literal work of miracles. And you've probably heard of this doctrine before, that we're supposed to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth. That was another doctrine that this, that this church preached. Rather than the biblical teaching that things are going to get worse, when we read the scriptures, we find that as we near the end days that things will get worse, that there will be an evil and perverse generation, that people will not go after God, but they will heap after themselves teachers to soothe their own itching ears. People will fall away from the church it will not get better. But what they teach is that you and I, by faith, are supposed to enact miracles so that we reach up into heaven and bring down heaven on earth and establish the heavenly kingdom on earth. If you ever hear that doctrine, there's a word for that, and it's called heresy. Because the kingdom of heaven is God's domain. It's not our authority. Do you understand? But you see, these people, they want to be like God. They want to be like God. The miracles, the, able to be, the, the ability to do all of these supernatural things, the ability to reach up into heaven and break it down to earth makes one like God. And what does this harken back to? Except in the garden. What did Eve tempt, what did Satan tempt Eve with? That you will be like God. If you eat of this fruit, you will not die, but indeed you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Christians, you and I, we cannot be like God. We can't even understand God. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are ushered into the likeness of God of Christ, you understand, whereby he will come and collect his bride. But the kingdom of heaven is not going to be established on earth until the first heaven and the first earth are destroyed. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there is no longer any sea. This world and everything that is in it, all the monuments that man has built, all the mountains and the valleys, all the oceans and the rivers, will be gone. All of it. Again, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, it says this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? What this is talking about is an utter destruction of everything. God's kingdom, the present heaven, is not ever going to come down to this present earth. Do you understand? And not only this, but even if it could, you wouldn't have the ability to do it. But heaven and earth will meet when the first heaven and the first earth have been destroyed have passed away. And God will make all things new. It's kind of like having an old beat up car. Right? There's a theology that teaches 
that if you take that old beat up car and you just polish it a little, replace the spark plugs and the oil filter and the air filter, well, there you go, you got a new car. Well, that's a problem because you don't have a new car. I've got a truck. It's back home in Valdosta. It's a 1990 with 210 something thousand miles on it. While I do love the truck, and it has had a lot of work on it, that truck is never, ever going to be new, and I'm going to have to keep replacing parts on it. For me to get a new vehicle, hypothetically, I've got to get rid of this one and go get another one, trade it in, so to speak. But folks, these teachers... And this is what Christ is warning them about, that these false prophets, these teachers, they're going to come and they're going to deceive. Now, he uses this phrase, if possible, even the elect. Um, but that, that phrase actually tells us that it, it's not possible for the elect to be misled. What he's saying is, is that the deceptions are going to be so great that if it was possible for the elect to be misled, they would be misled. Do you understand? Our faith is in the gospel, not in Jesus Christ. And Paul understood this when he wrote to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians, he's writing to them, and he says, the Jews seek for a sign. In other words, they seek for miracles and wonders. The Greeks seek for wisdom. In other words, the Greeks yearn for knowledge and philosophy. But we preach Christ and Christ crucified. That and that alone is the basis of your faith. That's what it means to build on the rock. That's what it means to not let yourself be moved about by every wind of doctrine that comes. Christians, stand on the rock. So many other denominations, so many other religions can enact miracles. But only faith in Jesus Christ through his word as revealed in the gospel is what saves. Now, Talking about these deceivers, one of the greatest deceptions that I think is of our modern age, and it's, I, I don't want to say it's a new one, but it, it is relatively modern. One of the greatest deceptions is, is that the belief in teaching that it is not in God's will for mankind to suffer and die. It's not in God's will for us to suffer. I have, I have heard this teaching before. There was a car accident, um, a really bad car accident in Troy where a boy died. And uh, unfortunately, this, this false preacher from this false church was invited to go and speak to the rest of the boys. And he told them, and he told them this so that they would have a positive view of God, but he told them, don't let anybody ever tell you that it was in God's will for that boy to die. Don't let anybody ever tell you that it was in God's will for that boy to die. In other words, what he's saying is that what happened to that boy happened outside of God's will. But while he may be trying to get them to have a positive view of God, actually what he has unfortunately done is expressed an incredibly weak God. God is sovereign over his creation. God is sovereign over his creation. Everything that has happened, that is happening, and will happen is the workmanship of his hand. Now, because of sin, listen to me, because of sin, this world is not heaven, that workmanship must include suffering. Now, the degree of suffering and its purpose is actually for two different purposes depending on which side of the cross that you're on. If you're on the side of the cross where you are not saved, where you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God puts suffering here so that you might be ushered towards the cross, so that you learn that this life is temporary. I tell you, that is probably one of the greatest things. COVID was awful, but perhaps one of the greatest things that came from that is people began to question their own mortality. People began to notice their own mortality. Suffering can push non-believers to the cross, and is that not good? 
Now, if you are a believer, you're also not promised, you are also not promised a carefree life where you will never suffer. But you hear some of these che- teachers like Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen teaches that if you just have faith, that, you just, that God just wants good for you, that you just got to name it and claim it, right? But listen to me. If God intends for his children to never suffer, to only know good and prosperity and health and wealth and happiness, then somebody better have told the disciples because they missed out. Folks, none of them were ever rich, and they, all of them, died horrific deaths. All of them. They were martyred for their faith. And they didn't seek to be rescued from it. All except for one, John, John the Apostle, who was exiled to the island of Patmos so that he could, Lord could, the Lord could deliver him the final book of our Bible, the book of Revelation. And he did die there. There's, a, there's an early Christian martyr by the name of Ignatius. Ignatius. Now, let me tell you what happened to him. Ignatius was about to be eaten alive by lions. The Romans had gotten him. They were going to kill him and persecute him. And this is the way they were going to do it. It was, it was fairly barbaric, but it was entertainment for the people, you understand. Ignatius was a Christian, and the Christians were getting blamed for all sorts of things. They were getting blamed for city fires that they didn't even start. So they started rounding up Christians. And, you know, Ignatius had heard of a plot by one of the nearby churches to come in there and rescue him, to break him out, so to speak. But Ignatius wrote that church a letter, and he pleaded with them to not rescue him. He said he could think of no greater honor for the Lord than to die for Jesus. But you see, that was the heart and mind of the early Christians. The majority of Christians today the majority of Christians today won't even honor him by gathering. Back then, they gathered under the threat of death. Today, Christians don't gather if they are tired. So Joel Osteen and people like him, they they tell people that if you just have faith, they use these verses out of context, John 14 13 and 14, he says, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. First of all, he was speaking to the apostles. And he had just given them extraordinary power in order to go out into the world and to proclaim the gospel. But folks, it's not just a name it and claim it verse. We don't name it and claim it. Now, we do pray and we ask in Jesus' name, but the first thing we must note is that our prayer, the believer's prayer, should be for his purposes and kingdom. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says this. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything, what's the next four words? According to his will. He hears us. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. The believer's prayer should be for his purposes and kingdom. Number two, the the believer's prayer should be based on God's merit and not our own merit or worth. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Now, I'm sure y'all have heard this because I've heard it time and time again. If you've been praying for some kind of miracle to happen in your life and it hasn't happened, maybe it's because you haven't done enough for God. Maybe it's because you haven't done enough good works. A lot of these prosperity gospel preachers, they'll say, well, you know how God's miracles work? The more money that you donate to my ministry, the greater the chance that God will answer your prayer. Or they say, if you've, if you've been sinning too, maybe if you've been sinning too much, God is separated from you, and he's not hearing your prayers. Maybe that's why your prayers are not getting answered. But folks, our prayers are not based 
on what we do or what we think. But our prayers are answered based solely on God's merit. When Jesus Christ came to this world and he suffered and died on the cross, he tore the veil. The veil that separated God from people was torn, and the Bible describes it as being torn from top to bottom. Do you know why it was torn in that way? Because it was so tall that no man could have gone up there and ripped the cloth. The fact that it was torn from top to bottom signifies a supernatural tearing, a tearing by the Holy Spirit, whereby God is now with His children. God is now in the world. You are the temple of God. The temple of God is not a place anymore. You are the temple. God is with you always. And while you certainly should repent of your sins and turn away from your sins and listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ paid the price so that you can have eternal communion with God. Do you understand? It is not based on your merit. It's based on what Christ did on the cross. And finally, it should be in the pursuit of God's glory alone. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Our minds... Our activities, our sinner, our soul, our inner man should be focused on glorifying God and glorifying God alone. And that should be at the center of our prayers. If you notice that you're praying for something that glorifies you and not God, then you are not praying for God's will. Do you understand? So when we pray, we must come to God. We must pray for his will. It must be based on his merit. And it should be in pursuit of God's glory alone. In other words, all the things that we should be doing, we should be seeking God's will. Now, this pastor that I've been talking about, his name is Lewis Johnson of the Vine in Troy, Alabama. And this is what he said. He said that he hates it. This is, this is word for word, by the way. He hates it when somebody prays, God, if it be in your will, let this person be healed. And the reason why he hates that is because he claims that that is a very weak prayer and that God is not going to listen to a weak prayer. In other words, if I want, if I want somebody to be healed, I don't ask if it's in God's will. I declare it to be God's will. I name it and I claim it in that person's life. I say a very strong prayer so that person can be healed. If that person's not healed, it's not... And in other words, what he's saying is, is that if that person's not healed, it's not anything to do with God, but it's because of my own lack of faith. Dear friends, we are just simply, and I love you all to death, but we are just simply not that powerful. Consider God in all of his glory and splendor. Consider his grandness and his majesty. Do you or your lack of faith or your sin have the ability to undo the will of God? No. You don't have that power. And thank God we don't have that power. Thank God we don't have that power. God's will will be done. Now, when we pray for somebody, if it is in God's will for that person to be healed, that person will be healed. But if it's not in God's will for that person to be healed, that person won't be healed. It is all the glory and all the power to God. It is not of us. It is only for us to marvel at his splendor and his mercy and his majesty. That is what we do. Now, we sang a song about this. I, th I think I'm going over a little bit. I don't know. No, we got time. Now, we sang a song that, that was talking about this. Y'all know the account of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke chapter 22, verse 44, says this. Luke chapter 22, verse 44. Luke chapter 22, verse 44, And being in agony, 
being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, that is, that is actually a, a medical condition. That's a problem. It's called hematidrosis, and I'm sure I just butchered that. And Nicole, who's a nurse, is watching, and I'm sure she'll correct me later. But hematidrosis is a condition in which you become so anguished, so stressed, so worrisome that your subcutaneous capillaries burst and the blood seeps into your sweat gland, thus causing you to literally sweat blood. That is how much Jesus was distressed before going to the cross. Needless to say, all of the sufferings that he endured on his way to the cross and the death that he suffered on the cross, brothers and sisters, I've just got to ask you, if God's own son was not spared such an immense suffering, what right do we have as fallible, sinful human beings to say that God wants us to not ever suffer? If God's own Son was not spared, why would we be spared? Why would we be spared? And actually, I pray that we rejoice in our suffering. Because if we suffer for Christ Jesus, then we suffer with Christ Jesus. And we can finally begin to understand and identify with our Savior who walked this earth 2,000 years ago, who knew you and created you and knew every hair on your head and died for you. If we suffer for Christ Jesus, we suffer with Christ Jesus, and we can finally begin to understand what it means to be a follower of Christ Jesus. One of the greatest things that I can pray for you is that if you are a Christian, that you grow in your faith, that you mature in your faith. And the Bible teaches us that God uses sufferings and persecutions to do that. To grow in our faith is not an easy thing. It is not to be taken lightly. Jesus was serious when he said, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your cross and follow me, not sit on your couch and watch televangelists all day. So the next time that you, are, that you feel the urge of the Holy Spirit to go share the gospel with somebody, and then some twinge of fear comes upon you and says, well, what if this person doesn't like me for it? I pray that your attitude changes and then you say, oh, this person may not like me for it. I may get the opportunity to suffer with Christ if I go share the gospel with this person. And so either the person comes to Christ and it is successful or they hate you for it and it is still successful as long as Christ Jesus is proclaimed. Brothers and sisters, let it be known that God is in control. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21 says this, Many are the plans in the mind of the man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Proverbs 16, verse 9, The heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. I can think of no greater comfort for you than for you to come to the understanding tonight that God is in absolute control of his creation and that we, we haven't messed anything up. We don't have that power. Everything that is coming to fruition is just as God has ordained it from the beginning. Now, I, I, I'm sure that I can get a lot of people who will discuss it with me, the, the similarities and the, the, the battle between God's sovereignty and man's free will. That's not where we're going to start with tonight. I don't under... I don't understand it. I don't understand it totally. But I can tell you this, that the Bible teaches that we are creatures of free will and that God is in absolute control. 
And I can think of no greater comfort for you than for you to leave from this place and understanding that. Brothers and sisters, my prayer for you is that you will not do what I did. When I was younger, when I was immature in my faith and unguided, I accepted pretty much anything that had the label of Christianity, no matter how absurd it was. I'm sure y'all have seen some of these buildings around here that have a, a hand psychic sign up there and it says Christian palm reader. I probably would have accepted that if I came across it. My prayer for you is that, that if you haven't been doing so, that from this point forward, that whenever you hear some kind of new teaching or doctrine, or if you ever experience some kind of miracle or supernatural event, that you will take that and draw it out in the light of God's word and see if it measures up to what it teaches. Don't accept everything, brothers and sisters. Also, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'll invite my, my brother Cole to come back up here to get ready. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior,